came in, I am ready to share this message today. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up to the book of James, okay? The book of James out in the lobby, there's always notes that you can pick up. Uh, so uh, you, can, uh, you can pick that up. You can follow along in, uh, with our notes, and uh, we are excited about that. Um, you know, I want to share that I'm just pushing myself to do something new. You know, someone said you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I'm a, kind of an old dog a little bit, I guess, getting a little older. But I think you can, all right? And so this morning I'm beginning a series in the book of James. Now, this book was the earliest letter that was written by the apostles to the church, all right? It's the very first letter that was written that made it into the canon of Scripture, at least. And it's historically been credited to the half-brother of Jesus Christ. James was a half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, the physical son of Mary and Joseph, and his name was James. Now, I want to say that I have been preaching the Bible for a long time, all right? In 2022, in November, I will be 40 years in full-time ministry, okay? That's a while. So in my career, I preached and I know this for a fact, at least 2,500 sermons or messages or teachings. And I can assure you that it's probably closer to 3,500. I don't keep track of all of those and never really taken time to count it. But uh, I use, uh, generally, I'm, a, I'm what they call a topical preacher. I'm a series preacher. I pick a topic and I pull from all of the Bible and preach that topic. But I'm trying to stretch myself this summer, and I'm going to go verse by verse exegetically through the book of James. So I'm hoping to preach the entire book of James this summer. And you say, well, why are you doing that, Pastor Bob? I'm doing it because I need to grow. This is going to stretch me, and it's going to cause us to grow as well. And I believe there's a lot of emphasis today, especially in the assemblies. of We're trying to get people back into the Word of God and the command to pastors is preach the word, and I want to do that, okay? So anyway, are you ready for the word? We're going to jump right in here. And uh, I want to preach today on the subject, how to respond to the trials and tests of life. Uh, the first couple of verses introduce James, who's, who he considers himself a bondservant of Jesus. He's writing to the 12 tribes who are, that are scattered abroad. That refers to the tribes of Israel. But let me just read one verse to get us started today. James chapter 1 and verse number 2. Okay, hope you can follow along. It says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I want you to notice some key words there. He says, first of all, he says, My brethren. And you say, well, he's writing to all these Jewish people. He's not really my brother. Yes, he is. He's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Do I have any servants of Jesus in the house? Amen. Amen. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ by the shed blood of Jesus. And so this is not just to Jewish believers. It's not just to the 12 tribes. It's for all of us. He says, my brethren. And then he says, count it all joy when. Everybody say when. When you fall into various trials. Now, I want you to know, it doesn't say if you fall into various trials, right? It doesn't say, you know, it's possible that sometime in your life you might have a test or trial. You know, James understands and James knows that you are going to go through trials. You're going to go through tests. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much of a righteous life you try to live. I don't care how much faith you have. I don't care how careful you have tried to orchestrate your life in such a way so as to avoid hardship and suffering and difficulty. I've got news for you. Everybody faces trials. Some will face more trials than others. And the Word of God actually tells us this from the beginning. If you read from front to back, you know that many of God's people went through trials, right? Absolutely. Job was a blameless man, upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. Yet in one day, Job lost everything from his family to his finances, to his fortune, to his fitness, to his friends. Job 
fell into trial. Trials. Daniel was a man who was totally committed to God, who prayed three times a day to the Lord, and all he got for his praying was a trip to the lion's den, right? He had some tests and trials. Joseph was a man of unquestioned integrity, decency, loyalty, and purity, who was sold into slavery by his very own brothers, thrown into prison for a crime crime he didn't even commit without even a trial. Wow. Paul, who was a great Christian, suffered many times over everything from being shipwrecked to beaten to being stoned to being lied about. I'm just here to tell you that life is going to give you some trials. Some of you might be thinking, oh, Pastor Bob, I haven't been to church in a long time. And now, uh, you know, I came here to get encouraged today. <laughs> this isn't a very encouraging message. Hold on just a moment. We're going to get to the encouraging part today, all right? All right, thinking about a trial is not encouraging. But when you think about, as this passage teaches us, what the end result of our trials are in life, it is encouraging for us. Now, I've never played a violin, much less made one. But uh, I do know that a violin is a very beautiful instrument physically, and it's capable in the hands of the right person of making a lot of beautiful sounds. And I, I did some research on violin making this week, all right? Every single violin is really an ex- extraordinary piece of workmanship. The pieces of wood are carefully cut from the trunk of the tree in sheets, and 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 which are then cut to the right shapes to fit together into a musical instrument. But that's not really the end of the process. The ribs, which are the wood that separate the front and the back plates of the instrument, they have to be planed to the width. They have to be heated and bent to the shape necessary. The the face plates are, are carved in, in a bowl type of shape and hollowed out to make just the right thickness uh, and curvature to resonate properly, okay? If it's too thick, the violin will resonate. If it's too thin, the violin won't, wouldn't hold the tension of the string. And so, and so if only, now follow me today, if only the tree trunk could speak, what would it say? It would say, what are you doing to me? Why are you cutting me up? Why are you putting me in the fire and heating me up? Get that knife away from me. But each painful cut, each bending and twisting is necessary to make something beautiful. If only the tree knew and understood what the violin maker was doing, how the tree might rejoice that it was being transformed into something of beauty that would have a beautiful song to play to the world. And so it is with us. How many of you tracking with me today? Wave at me for a moment today, all right? That's what James was doing in this passage. James is giving us insight into how God makes our lives something beautiful that reflects His glory. And all of the trials that we go through are, are to make you into something more beautiful, not only in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the world. And the end of, of our tribulation and trials ought to be that we are more like the person of Jesus Christ. And so as you're going through those trials, we've got to recognize that those trials have a purpose in our life. All right, so James gives us some powerful and positive keys to making it through trials. Today I'm going to give you four of them. You can jot them down, try to remember them. They're simple and easy to remember today. First of all, number one, you've got to decide to have the right attitude. James 1, 2 says, my brethren, count it all joy. Everybody say joy. Count it joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I remember many years ago, about 23 and some years ago, I was sitting in a church service with an evangelist by the name of Michael French was preaching. I was at Cedar in Cedar Hill at a church called Trinity Church. And and uh, I was in a deep trial, okay? I had stopped being a missionary. I had gotten my last check 
from being a missionary. I was unemployed. I had a wife and three children to take care of. The Sunday before, I had put my last $40 worth of tithe from the $400 I got in the mail. I had paid my tithe to the Lord. And I was there in that service. And as I walked in, I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders. Who's ever felt that way? Come on. You felt like there's a heaviness and a burden on That's the way I felt that day. And this evangelist gets up and he starts talking. And he says, if you're going through a trial, he said, what you need to do is throw yourself a party. Now, I wish I could tell you, because it says count it all joy, right? Just throw yourself a party. I wish I could tell you that I was so spiritual, you know, that I just started praising and rejoicing. But I'm going to tell you, I didn't. I didn't. I was not happy that night. I felt it uh, that night. Now, by the end of the night, I did more of a desperate cry to the Lord. Uh, My hands, uh, I praised the Lord, but my hands felt heavy to even lift them up that night. But shortly thereafter, God moved the mountains and and answered my prayers. And that, that season ended. But I want you to know, during the season of that trial, I grew spiritually. My trust in God grew. My faith grew. My knowledge of how God was able to take care of me grew. And I can actually look back with joy now because of the provision vision and the care and the love of God that was shown to me. So what I'm saying is I know that it's difficult. This piece of uh, scripture can be difficult if you're actually in a trial to say count it all joy. I mean, how can the word joy and trial be found in the very same scripture? Come on. I mean, you got, it's like, really, you got to be kidding, God. You know, some things are meant to go together, right? Sure, peanut butter and jelly, milk and cookies, potatoes and gravy, the word the like Virgin and Mary, those things all are intended to go together. But when we look at trials and when we look at the word joy, it doesn't seem like those two things belong together. Because you see, our world thinks that joy comes by avoiding trials Not by encountering them. And we as Christians often buy into this. And joy doesn't automatically come when you encounter a trial, does it? Not unless you understand the purpose. If the goals of our lives, if the goal of our life is ease, then trials are bad, right? If we're living simply to be comfortable and to be healthy and to be wealthy, then trials are bad. But if the goal of our life is to become more like Jesus Christ, then those trials can be good. Now, now James is not some kind of a nut, okay? He's not kind of a person that, that says, oh, man, it is just so much fun to feel pain. That's not what he was saying here. We aren't to have an attitude of joy because we feel pain. And some trials and tests in life can be extremely painful. We have to have an attitude of joy because what we're doing is we're looking forward in time to see what those trials can produce in us. In fact, the word count it is a word that literally means to lead or to look ahead. We are to look forward to what will be accomplished when we overcome. A couple of years ago, I started working out, all right? I was training and uh, lifting weights, you know, doing all those wonderful squats and all like that. And and man, that's a trial. Come on, I got a witness in the house. Hello. Especially leg day. Hello. Uh, You know, I, I don't look forward to it. It's a test of my endurance. It's a trial. But let me tell you something counting on something, all right? I'm counting that if I continue to exercise, that when I'm older, I'll still be able to be active and doing a lot of things, right? Uh, It's a test and a trial, but I'm counting on something. I'm looking forward to the joy that when I'm 87, 88, 89, 90, whatever, I can get out of a chair all by myself. Hello? So when we look at trials, we're really looking ahead. Jesus, of course, is our supreme example of this. This has happened to him. Hebrews 12 in verse number 2, all right? The greatest trial that Jesus ever faced was on the cross. You know that. That must have been difficult. 
The cross wasn't fun. He prayed, Father, take this from me. It was not what Jesus' flesh wanted to do. He didn't want to suffer. There was a shame involved in being hung openly on the cross. But this is what the Scripture says. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the, notice what it says, for the joy, everybody say joy. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, Christ looked beyond the shame and the pain and the, and the embarrassment of being treated like a criminal and hung on a cross. He looked beyond that and he counted it joy. Why? Because he knew that when he said it is finished, amen, and, and he died on that cross, he knew that there were many sons and daughters that were going to be brought to glory. Come on, church. He knew that there were going to be many homes that would be changed. Many lives that would have encouragement. There would be forgiveness and freedom that would come in His name. It was a joy because of the good works that you and I can do in His name. What He did, He looked ahead and He counted joy. Amen. Just like we have to as well. And when all this came up with this crisis of COVID-19, our routines were all changed up. And I don't know about you, but man, I used to love having church the way we used to have it. Come on. Amen. I'm, I'm a guy that likes to shake people's hands and get close to people and talk to people. And, and uh, you know, I was, I, you know, for a while I was like, how am I going to respond to this thing, you know? Uh, but, but I chose to look ahead, all right? I chose to believe this about God, that my God has a purpose in everything. Amen? He has a plan. He's going to do something in my life. He's going to do something in your life. He's going to bring the church of Jesus Christ to level of maturity and completeness in Christ. So I knew that I had to be joyful. Come on. Do I have anybody that says I'm going to choose to be joyful? Not because of what I'm going through, but because when I know when I get on the other side that I'm going to be a better person for it. Come on. I can be joyful. Number two. The second key is not only do you have to uh, Decide what kind of attitude you want to have. Number two, you've got to embrace the process. Embrace the process. I remember the first time I ever heard Rick Warren say these words. This is his one of his quotes that he says. And, and I was at a conference and I heard him say these words in person. And I immediately both didn't like the statement and then I also knew that it was true. All right. I'm gonna, he said this. He said, God cares more about your character than he does about your comfort. That's true. How many know that's true? It's absolutely true. Do I like that statement? No. Why? Because I like comfort. Do I got any people that like a little comfort? Come on. Sure, we like comfort. But what God does, God puts us in a process that allows our character to grow and become more like Jesus. It is a process of the testing of our faith. And what happens is as we get our faith tested, it produces in us patience and perseverance. And that patience and perseverance Perseverance does the perfect work of causing us to be mature and complete and lacking nothing. Amen. Here's the process in the Word. James chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, the first part of the process is the testing of your faith. Some of us, it's been a long time since we've been in school. Hello. Amen. We don't remember the test. Some pass and some fail. And the beautiful thing about God is that if you fail His test... He'll let you take the test again tomorrow. Anybody ever done that? Okay, you're, you're struggling with something and you struggle with it all day and you fail the test. Guess what? You can get up and struggle with it again tomorrow. Come on. God lets you continue in that. But, but, but the purpose of a test reveals the strength or the weakness of the faith that we have. And there's a lot of people that they, they say, you know, Pastor Bob, man, I've got a lot of faith and I hope that's you, right? 
fact, I believe I'm preaching to the most faith-filled people in the world today. Come on, I believe it. But, but a lot of people think to themselves, they think, you know, I go to church every Sunday, I sing praises, I, I give my money, I take notes, I try to live a good life. My faith is strong. Well, can I just say something today? The only way that you can really know how strong your faith is, is find yourself in a place where there's trouble in your life. Am I right? You see, it's easy to have faith when everything's going great. But when trouble comes, that's when our faith must stand up. Faith must not only stand the test of time, but it's got to stand the test of trouble. Proverbs 24 and 10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Amen. But I've discovered that there's a lot of believers out there who, who, who they cannot be stopped by tests and trials of life. Now, now they, may, they might uh, be slowed down a little bit. They might get tripped up every once in a while. But in the end, they're still going to be standing. And the truth is, their faith is going to come out like gold. You know, gold uh, it gets tested to see if it's real gold. First Peter uh, 1 and verse 7 in the contemporary English version says this, Your faith will be like gold that has been tested in a fire. God is, gold, excuse me, is sent through scorching fire. But you know what? That gold has nothing to worry or to fear from the fire because all that happens is the gold becomes purer. And the process that God puts us in and the testing of our faith actually produces in us patience or perseverance. Now, I don't know about you, but, but you can ask my wife. I'm not the most patient person, all right? I'm not. I'll admit it. I'll confess it. I'm not a patient person, you know? And uh, I don't know if you've ever prayed a prayer like this when you're in a test or trial, but I've prayed this prayer pretty often at times. I call it a, I call it a, uh, you know, please God end this prayer. Who's ever prayed that? Please God end this. Please God, I'm tired of this. Please God, I'm ready for something different. But you see, what God is building in us is perseverance. Now, in the, in the New International Version, this verse uses the word perseverance. It says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And persevering in the spiritual world, okay, how many of you are still with me today, is not just saying, I'm just going to grin and bear it and get through this somehow anyway. You know, that's not what perseverance is. Perseverance means that you're still standing in faith and trusting in the Lord. Amen. That you are not letting the world or the enemy or the difficulty or the situation push, push you backward. Now, your shield of faith might be full of fiery darts and you may be weary in spirit. But let me tell you something. When the trials and tests come, you will still be standing. If you have a faith and you believe in the Lord. You know, many years ago, I got to hear Dave Reaver I don't know if you've ever heard of Dave Reaver. Dave was a, a man who was in Vietnam many years ago. And uh, while he was there, he was a very vocal Christian and always shared his faith with everybody that was in his, his uh, platoon. All the other guys knew that he was a believer. And uh, one day, just a couple of feet from where he was at, a grenade went off. I believe it was a phosphorus grenade went off, and it literally uh, damaged him. I mean, blew all of his skin off. He was completely uh, burned in, in a horrendous fashion, and he wound up falling at that, as that grenade hit. He fell into a body of water, and he was struggling in the water. But he, and I've heard him preach this. He said, as I came up out of the water, he said these words, I still believe in you, God. He was going, he knew he was going through the difficult trial, the difficult test, but he came out, the first thing he wanted to declare with his mouth was, I still believe in you, God. And he goes on to tell of the long series of physical treatments that he had and how difficult it was to get back in, in, into, into life. And, and uh, you know, but, but what happened was... 
because he allowed that perseverance to be a part of his life. His ministry as, a, as an evangelist just took off. God really gave him a platform because he persevered. And he is a very mature and excellent man of God. Because let me tell you something, perseverance causes us to be made perfect. That's what the scripture says. Let me read it to you. It says, but let patience or perseverance have its perfect work. James 1, 4, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, perfect here does not mean that you're sinless. All right. All right. That's not what this is talking about. It's got the idea of being made complete. It's the idea of being made a mature person. Uh, Jesus did not have to be made perfect, right? How many of you know Jesus was perfect? Did Jesus ever sin? No, he did not. He absolutely, there was found in him no guile, even though he was either tested or tempted in all ways. It doesn't matter. He was tested and became, he, he was as found to be complete, right? It says, Hebrews 2.10 says this, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. This is referring to Jesus. Jesus wasn't made sinless through the sufferings that he went through. He was made complete. He was made mature. Now, in my yard, I've got a great big tree. It's uh, a live oak tree. And I have, in the last 23 years, raked up hundreds and probably thousands and thousands of acorns under that tree. Those little acorns, man, they are everywhere. They're hard to step on. And I've got big bags of them and threw them out and put them in the trash can. And, and uh, you know, but the power of that acorn is that that acorn can become a mighty oak. And you see, that's what God is in the process of doing. God is in the process of taking us who are acorns and transforming us into a mighty oak. And that's why we can have joy in our trials. Because you see, an acorn is just an immature version of the mature version of the oak tree. Come on, how many of you believe that God wants us to become like a great and mighty oak? Come on, give the Lord a and to praise today. Amen? Amen. And then number three, we've got to learn how to lean into the trial. Accept it and say, I'm going to grow through this. When you're going through something, instead of saying, rescue me, God, prayers. Uh, maybe you're too spiritual for that, but I've prayed some of those. Rescue me, Lord. Uh, how about this prayer? You know, kind of a pity party prayer. Poor, poor, pitiful me. <laughs> We pray those kind of prayers. Instead of those kind of prayers, what we need to start doing is lean into the trial and say, okay, God, I know I'm in this. I know I'm going through this. I might as well grow from it. Amen? And then we can pray prayers that ask God for wisdom. That's what James suggests. James 1 and verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given to him. If we're going to make it through the tests and trials of life, we've got to be willing to confidently come before God and say, God, I need your wisdom on this subject. I need you to give wisdom. And the beautiful thing about God is he says, I'll give it to you if you ask. All you've got to do is ask and I'm going to give it to you. Not just a little bit. I want to liberally give you wisdom. Our God is a giver of wisdom. And I like it that it says he will give uh give us wisdom uh, and he will not reproach us for that right he won't reproach us that word reproach is is the it really the word reproach is an expression of disapproval or disappointment and let me tell you the devil will come up to you and tell you listen you don't need to ask god for wisdom he's already disappointed in you he's already uh, discouraged with your life don't ask god for wisdom let me tell you something when we come to god and ask god for wisdom with our kid for our kids our family, for our job, for our home, for our finances. We say we humbly ask Him for wisdom. Let me tell you something. God is not going to say, listen, I'm disappointed in you. He's going to say, I'm so happy that you came to me asking for wisdom. I've got all the wisdom that you need. Let me give it to you. So first of all, you've got to ask, and then you've got to receive it. Well, you say, how can I receive God's wisdom? You receive God's wisdom by knowing and understanding God's Word. Amen. 
You want wisdom, you've got to know the Word of God. Being daily in the Word, trusting in Him, being in church, listening to Bible studies, whatever. All of that helps us to know God's wisdom from His Word. And then God's wisdom also can come from the Holy Spirit in prayer. Amen? A lot of people think that prayer is this one-way conversation with God where we do all the talking. No, prayer is supposed to be a two-way conversation. Amen? We petition God, and then we get quiet, and we listen. Be still before the Lord. Let your mind grow quiet. And pretty soon you'll be able to hear the gentle whisperings of the Holy Spirit telling you exactly what you need to do. Come on. Is there anybody here that believes that God is a God that can give us the wisdom to get us through our trials? I believe that He will. Amen. And then lastly, number four, this is what He says. He says, don't doubt. Boy, I like James. He was up in your face kind of preacher, right? A straight shooter. He did not mince words. He just said, don't doubt. James 1, 6-8 says this, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, for he's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Amen. When you're in the midst of a test or a trial, you need to be asking God for His wisdom in faith. And let me tell you, we cannot doubt the goodness of God in our lives. We cannot doubt that He has our best interest at, our, at heart. What I liked about that new song that we sang was at the very end, especially where it said that He's for us. We can't doubt that God is for us. He's in favor of us. Amen. We have to believe that we're going to win, that we're going to come through, that, that in God's goodness. Because when we say words like these, we're doubting. When we say, Lord, I don't really think that you love me. Really, you're doubting his love, right? I don't think you're going to be able to solve this, Lord. You're doubting his power. When you're saying, Lord, nobody can do anything about this situation. Uh, really? God can use anybody. Come on. Amen. Uh, uh, when we say, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to change what you're doubting the size of the Jesus inside of you. Amen. We have to believe in God's goodness. Amen. We cannot doubt God because you have to understand today that the same God, hear me today, hear me today, church, the same God that in His sovereignty allowed a situation or a test or a trial in your life, He's the very same God that is going to walk with you all the way through to the other side. Come on. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you even to the end of the age. Don't doubt His power. He's going to be the one to give you the strength. Come on. He's going to be the one to give you the ability to persevere, to hang on. And He's going to be be the one that will bring you to a place of completeness, of wholeness, and a maturity in Him. You see, you are in the process of being formed by Almighty God to look like Jesus. He has a goal in mind. Amen? Now let me tell you, we can't be tossed about like we're waves, right? Can I tell you about Jesus and waves? Come on. How many know Jesus walked on the water? Hello? Jesus walked all across the waves. Even in the midst of a storm, the waves were underneath His feet. He, he was not like a wave that was tossed to and fro. Jesus was never unstable because you see, He was anchored into His Father's will. He said, this is the thing that I'm going to do every day. I'm going to do the Father's will. And you see, that's God's goal for you and for me. God's will is that we become strong and unmoved and unshaken in our faith. A lot of people say, well, Pastor Bob, you know, I just don't feel it. I feel unsure. I feel unbalanced. And can I ask you a question? Since when do we go by our feelings? Right? Feelings can lie to you. How many of you ever had a feeling lie to you? Sure. Feelings are fickle. They'll lead you astray. They will mess up your life if you let go by your feelings. We've got to live by faith. And I was thinking about Abraham, right? 
He was a great man of faith, but he had a test and a trial. The Lord said, now look, I want you to take your only son, Isaac, and I want you to go up on the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Now let me ask you something. What do you think that Abraham was feeling as he walked up that mountain, as he gathered all the sticks together, as he got the knife and he put it inside? I don't know what he carried it in. You know, he put it in something to carry it. As he got the, you know, the, the fire prepared, What was he feeling? I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what he was feeling. It's what he was thinking that counts. Because the Bible tells us that Abraham was reasoning with his mind the whole time. I'm sure his feelings were saying, you're making a big mistake by trying to sacrifice your son Isaac. But let me tell you something. In his mind, his mind was reasoning. And it was saying, if God, the one who promised me this son, who promised me that my children would be as the sand of the stars by this son, if he asked me to even slay my own child, that very same God is able to to, to, uh, raise that child up from the dead. You see, he wasn't going on his feelings. He was going on his faith. Come on, somebody. That's what we need to overcome doubt. It's not how we feel. It's our faith. And sometimes the feelings will overwhelm us, but we've got to reason with our mind and say, you know something? My God is big enough to get me through this. I'm going to be all right. He has my best interest at heart. Come on, give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. Your faith will keep you stable. If you've ever met someone who's an older person, and you sit down and begin to talk to them, and they start telling you everything they've been through in their life, and you listen to them and you think, wow, look at what this person has gone through. And yet you see in them a wholeness, a completeness, a maturity. Let me ask you something. If you never went through any trials, if you never had any tests in life, how would you then in turn be able to tell your very own children, this is how you go. This is what you need to do. This is what God is able to do in your life. How could you ever even share your faith with an unbeliever who's going through a test or a trial if you hadn't went through similar tests and trials? I'll tell you what, that's what God wants in us. He wants us to have a complete whole understanding of who He is and knowing that we don't have to doubt, but that He's a God that's worthy. He's able to be trusted. It doesn't matter how many are in the congregation this morning, how many are listed online. It doesn't matter. The most important thing that matters is do you trust God? He's a God that you can hold on to and depend upon, and He'll see you through the storms of life. Amen. Would you stand with me today? Thank you so much for being with us today. Amen. And listening to this message. Amen. You've got a right attitude. Amen. Count it all joy. Amen. Embrace the process. Amen. Lean into it, asking Him for wisdom. And never doubt His goodness and His love. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. And I believe that the Lord wants to minister to somebody today. Maybe there's somebody who's watching this Facebook live broadcast and you're in a deep dark test and trial. Listen, God is with you. He has not abandoned you. He is right there. Amen. He's going to bring you through to the other side and you're going to shine 